Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon. Some say the trouble's in the street. Hello, and welcome to Human Rights Here Now, a program by the Alliance for Human Rights in Santa Cruz County. The Alliance envisions our county as a harmonious and egalitarian multicultural society in which people are well informed about human rights as defined in U.S. and international law. My name is Sonia, and today we'll be talking about an important human right, the right to be free from religion and superstition. We'll look at how this freedom is abridged around the world. We'll look briefly at the history of the world's current major religions, the state of religious freedom in the world today, and also discuss what you can do about it. Please join us as we discuss this important topic. Joining me today is Howard Berman, a Santa Cruz resident who, along with me and many others, is interested in seeing this type of persecution eliminated around the world. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. I would like to start this uh, video about the history of the world's current major religions. The fascinating thing to me that this video shows is that religions come and go. The religions of the world are invented by humans and passed down in cultures and spread through evangelism and conquest. And they die out in certain areas at different times, depending on the political power in charge. The expansion and shrinkage of religious territory that this video shows, and as the title of the map states explicitly, are nearly always the same as the expression and shrinkage of political power, often an empire. And how many of the conflicts represented by this map were fought explicitly in the name of expanding the religion of the political power? This is a history of war, for the causes of some religion and religious war still rages in the world today. Our focus today is religious intolerance and violence directed against atheists. Many of the world's religions have adherents who have committed violence in the name of their religion against those who do not believe as they do. But we have to admit to the fact that the religion of our time, the 21st century, with the most adherents willing to commit violence in its name for its so-called defense and advancement is Islam. Let's take a look at the recent international attempts to provide the universal right of conscience to believe or not believe, and if the former to practice any religion. And let's take a look at the Muslim response. On December 10, 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 18 of the Declaration states, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. This and other documents, such as the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment, affirm that everyone should have the right to believe and practice their religion but do not explicitly state that everyone has the right not to believe or practice a religion as well. To many people, this seems like an oversight that contributes to the persecution of non-religious people around the world. Most Islamic countries have signed the Declaration of Human Rights and other human rights agreements. However, in 1948, Saudi Arabia abstained from the ratification vote on the UN Declaration stating it violated Islamic Sharia law. In 1982, Saeed Rajay Khorasani, Iran's representative to the UN, said the declaration is, quote, a secular understanding of the Judeo-Christian tradition, unquote, and that Muslims could not agree to it without breaking Islamic law. On June 30, 2000, Muslim nation members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, the OIC, officially supported the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam, an alternative to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It states, people have, quote, freedom and right to a dignified life in accordance with the Islamic Sharia, unquote, or Sharia law. You don't have to take our word for it that the goal of many modern Islamist movements is to impose Sharia law at the nation state level. A Pew Research study released this year 
shows that the majority of Muslims worldwide and in 25 out of 38 Islamic countries polled, a majority of their Muslim citizens want Sharia to be the official law of their nation. What does Sharia say about apostasy? Well, according to the blog Sharia Laws, and I'm quoting here, there is no punishment for apostasy in Islam. Unfortunately, many other Muslims do not hold this view. Here is just one example from several verses of the Quran, ordering death to non-believers, that is, non-Muslims. Quran 4.89, quote, they wish that you should disbelieve as they disbelieve, and then you would be equal. Therefore, take not to yourselves friends of them until they emigrate in the way of God. Then, if they turn their backs, take them and slay them wherever you find them. Take not to yourselves any one of them as friends or helpers. And from the reliance of the traveler and tools of the worshiper, that is a manual of Islamic laws codified by a gentleman named Misery, quote, when a person who has reached puberty and is sane voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed. And if you're a Muslim, who kills an apostate? No monetary reward, but also no punishment. There is no indemnity for killing an apostate. But let's take a look at how Sharia manifests itself in the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights under Islam in the case of non-belief or apostasy. Now I'm quoting from the Cairo Declaration. Article 10, Islam is the religion of unspoiled nature. It is prohibited to exercise any form of compulsion on man or to exploit his poverty or ignorance in order to convert him to another religion, that is, other than Islam, <laughs> or to atheism. So we're talking here about the crime of trying to convert someone out of Islam. That's when coercion and compulsion is illegal. Article 19D, there shall be no crime or punishment of apostates except as provided for in the Sharia. And we just heard what that was all about. Right. Article 22a, everyone shall have the right to express his opinion freely in such manner as would not be contrary to the principles of Sharia. Article 22b, everyone shall have the right to advocate what is right and propagate what is good and warn against what is wrong and evil according to the norms of Sharia. Article 22C, information is a vital necessity to society. It may not be exploited or misused in such a way as may violate sanctities and the dignity of prophets, undermine moral and ethical values, or disintegrate, corrupt, or harm society or weaken its faith. You can read the entire text of the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam at the wikiislam.net site. Well, there you have it. You can, uh, it sounds good, you know, the starts of all those uh, yeah. rules, uh, those articles in the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, well, we can um, protect, you know, free speech if it doesn't violate Sharia law, in which case you might then be subject to death. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of countries today, though, that are sort of pulling back from that a little bit. I realize there's still many who are not. Right. But perhaps the tide has begun to turn a little bit. I know some of the Western European countries, Ireland, for example, mm -hmm. has been pulling back from some of those uh, draconian laws about uh, insulting religion in any way. So I think maybe we're on the way. Yes, I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Um, and I think that the, the holdovers and the, the, the countries that are going to take the longest happen to be um, Muslim states. Do you think international pressure will have any effect? I hope it does. I mean, that's, that's really the key here. Yeah. Um, and that's absolutely what the UN has been trying to do uh, with the Declaration of Human Rights. But we have this, this counter move uh, trying to protect defamation against religion, meaning most of the time defamation against Islam, um, pushing back. And um, that's, that's the key. Right. In the Pew Research Study of International Muslim Attitudes in the section titled 
penalty for converting to another faith, we find this statement, quote, in six of the 20 countries where there are adequate samples for analysis, at least half of those who favor make Islam making Islamic law the official law also support executing apostates. In a November 21, 19, uh, 2012 publication by Pew Research entitled Laws Penalizing Blasphemy, Apostasy, and Defamation of Religion are widespread. We must responsibly point out that not all the countries with such laws are Muslim. The report cites the cases of a man arrested in India, for example, for claiming uh, a statue of Jesus in, in Mumbai with supposed miraculous qualities is fake. And a case of another arrest of a man in Greece for posting satirical comments on Facebook about an Orthodox Christian monk. But still, while the story does point out that as of 2011, nearly half of the countries and territories in the world, 47% to be exact, have laws or, laws or policies that penalize blasphemy, apostasy, abandoning one's faith, or defamation of religion. I, I wish the report and study had made clear which of those countries had laws that imposed the death penalty uh, for these offenses. The International Humanist and Ethical Union, the IHEU, issued a report last year, Freedom of Thought 2012, a global report on discrimination against humanists, atheists, and non-religious. That reveals that out of 60 countries examined, seven have laws providing the death penalty for expressing atheism or apostasy. That's leaving one's religion. And these seven countries are not, not surprisingly Muslim. Afghanistan, Iran, Maldives, Mauritania, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan. These countries ban or severely curtail the publication of atheist thought. Bangladesh, Egypt, Indonesia, Kuwait, and Jordan. And these countries are also Muslim. In many Muslim countries, non-Muslim citizens must register as adherents of other officially recognized religions. And those are usually just Christianity and Judaism in addition to Islam. Atheists are thereby forced to lie to obtain official documents without which they can't attend university, receive medical treatment, travel abroad, or drive. Of course, in Saudi Arabia, if you're a woman, being a Muslim still doesn't get you the right to drive. The IHEU says of its Freedom of Thought 2012 report that it, quote, highlights a sharp increase in arrests for blasphemy on social media this year, 2012. The previous three years, 2009 to 2011, saw just three such cases. But in 2012, more than a dozen people in 10 countries have been prosecuted for blasphemy on Facebook or Twitter. The statement then goes on to list six notable examples of prosecution. Besides the example of the Greek man, Philippos Loizos, charged with insulting religion for his Facebook page satirizing a Greek Orthodox monk, the examples of cyber blasphemers being prosecuted come from Islamic countries. Specifically, Indonesia, Tunisia, Turkey, and Egypt. Going to jail for expressing one's atheistic views is unjust, an infraction against the human right to freedom of conscience and expression. Being put to death for blasphemy, apostasy, or defamation of religion, this is the grossest abuse of human rights, the, li the right to life. Such injustice is especially repugnant when practiced and enforced by the state. But let's look at other examples of the infringement of the human right to freedom of conscience and expression when religion creates vigilantes. Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh was murdered, shot and stabbed, in Amsterdam on November 2nd, 2004 by a radical 26-year-old Muslim with dual Moroccan-Dutch citizenship. The murderer left a note on van Gogh's body citing his act as revenge for the filmmaker's short commentary film sub called Submission Part One about the commonality of domestic violence against Muslim women by their male family members. On July 22, 2011, the Norwegian Anders Breivik murdered 77 people, mostly youths, at a youth camp 
in an island by shooting them, but also including those in downtown Oslo who died from a bomb he planted in the government district and set off before uh, going to the island. He went on his rampage after publishing a 1,500-page Christian manifesto online that said, and said at his trial that his attack was necessary in response to the Islamization of Norway. Members of the neo-Nazi Norwegian group Vigrid and the group Stop the Islamization of Norway testified at his trial. Yes, I do think Islam and Islamic countries pose greater and graver threats to the rights and lives of atheists and all non-Muslims. But as the example of Anders Breivik and his atrocious act sadly shows, the problem is religion, particularly any religion that advocates killing people for disagreeing with it. Again, this is a worldwide issue. Examples of anti-atheist discrimination have been reported in 60 countries, from Algeria to Zambia, and including in the United States. It's been reported in brutal theocracies notorious for their human rights violations, like Pakistan and Iran, and it's been reported in supposed secular paradises, like Sweden and France. It's worse in some countries than others, obviously, but this is a global problem. Well, I think it is uh, a global problem. Let's look instead at some good news now on this front. In Israel in 2011, writer Yoram Kaniuk won an historic court victory to register officially as without religion instead of Jewish. The European Union established guidelines on the promotion and protection of freedom of religion or belief in June of 2013. These guidelines assert that the freedom to have or not to have or adopt, which includes uh, the right uh, to change, a religion or belief of one's choice. But the document also asserts, and I'm quoting here again, as opposed to the freedom to have a religion, to hold a belief or not to believe, the freedom to manifest one's religion or belief may be subject to limitations, but only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health, or morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. These limitations must be in accordance with international standards and must be strictly interpreted. Limitations for other reasons, such as national security, are not permitted. The last condition makes me think of France's recent laws against wearing burqas in public places yeah. and against the wearing of anything religious like cross necklaces, headscarves, yarmulkes in public schools. This is also in France. I wonder if the EU's last stipulation was aimed at France. While we decry the denial of rights to atheists by many governments, particularly Muslim governments throughout the world, are we being hypocritical if we support France's recent bans against religious attire in public schools and against the wearing of burqas in public places? I'm inclined to agree with CBS blogger Bonnie Airby, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce her name, who wrote in July 2009, quote, women's rights advocates did not fight for the right to vote and for equality under the law only to have immigrant women adopt dress codes that paint them as second class and as accepting of male dominance. A woman who sets herself back sets all women back along with her. Burkas are an affront to Western culture. Political correctness should not prevent Westerners from stating that publicly." Unquote. But again, lest we run the risk of appearing anti-Muslim only, let's look at another recent example of the infringement of freedom of expression and, in particular, of the freedom to protest against religion that has occurred in Russia. On February 21, 2012, Five members of the punk rock all-female group Pussy Riot staged a performance in a Moscow cathedral. The video they filmed of their performance and arrest, Punk Prayer, Mother of God, Chase Putin Away, went viral on the internet. As the title of the performance and its words state explicitly, it's a protest against Putin and against the support the Pussy Riot members say he receives from the Russian Orthodox Church. Two Pussy Riot members and I'm not going to attempt their names here, 
uh, remain in jail. And the former uh, Maria, or Mr. Name, uh, she's engaged in a hunger protest against her mistreatment. The crime these two women were convicted of is, quote, hooliganism motivated by religious hatred, unquote. They were sentenced to two years imprisonment. Amnesty International identifies them as prisoners of conscience. <laughs> The Pussy Riot sentencing in Russia is certainly draconian and clearly a denial of freedom of speech and from religion. But let us now return to an even worse offense against atheists, death, particularly in the form of state law, the case only in some Islamic nations. The Organization of the Islamic Conference has repeatedly put forth resolutions in the United Nations Human Rights Council to denounce defamation of religion. <laughs> the latest effort was put forth in March 2010 by Pakistan on behalf of the OIC. The resolution passed March 25, 2010. The American representative, Eileen Donahue, the representative to the Human Rights Council, said this about her vote against the defamation of religion resolution. Quote, we cannot agree that prohibiting speech is the way to promote tolerance. And because we continue to see the defamation of religions concept used to justify censorship, criminalization, and in some cases, violent assaults and deaths of political, radical, and religious minorities around the world. I must point out that Ms. Donahoe, in the same statement, obliquely criticized the French government for its recent laws banning religious attire in public schools and banning burqas in public places. Quote, we share concerns about restrictions on places of worship and on religious attire. But Ms. Donahoe points, points out that death for expressing atheism, for blasphemy, for apostasy, for defamation of religion, for hooliganism motiva motivated by religious hatred are codified into national law in a large number of countries. And while Ms. Donahoe does not state it, most of them are Muslim. By now, I've certainly opened myself up to the charge that I'm an Islamophobe. And actually, that puts me in some rarefied and dignified atheist intellectual company, that of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. These two have been charged with Islamophobia and racism for their contention, which I am also making, that all religions are intellectually and rationally insupportable, but that Islam in particular poses a unique and deadly threat to dissidents, atheists, secularists, and essentially all non-Muslims. Sam Harris, author of several books, including The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, has written, quote, my criticism of faith-based religion focuses on what I consider to be bad ideas held for bad reasons leading to bad behavior. Facts of this kind demand that we make distinctions among faiths that many confused or dishonest people will interpret as a sign of bigotry. I believe that atheists, secularists, and humanists do the world no favors by insisting that all religions be criticized in precisely the same terms and to the same degree. I consider Islam to be especially belligerent and inimical to the norms of civil discourse. My views are often described as racist by my critics. It is said that I am suffering a terrible case of Islamophobia. Worse, I am spreading this disease to others and using a veneer of philosophical atheism and scientific skepticism to justify the political oppression, torture, and murder of innocent Muslims around the world." Unquote. Richard Dawkins, author of several groundbreaking books on biology and evolution and of the God delusion, has also been called an Islamophobe for tweeting, quote, all the world's Muslims have fewer Nobel Prizes than Trinity College, Cambridge. They did great things in the Middle Ages, though, unquote. When thus accused, he responded, quote, if you think Islam is a race, you are a racist yourself, unquote. When accused of bigotry, he responded, quote, how can the assertion of an undeniable fact be bigotry, unquote.
Okay. Well, I, I, I feel exactly as Sam Harris and uh, Richard Dawkins do that, yes, we do have to make distinctions because all religions do not behave the same. Jains, for example, advocate absolutely zero violence. Um, they don't believe in killing any living creature whatsoever. But one of the big problems that continues to be found all over the world is that any criticism of religion is taken as a serious no-no. Right. I mean, we can criticize people's politics or their sports interests, and it seems to generally be okay. Criticize their religion, off base. Right. And that's what all of this really amounts to. Right. Well, but <laughs> the big distinction that Sam Harris and, and Richard Dawkins want to make is that uh, when you criticize Islam, right. your life could be on the line. Yeah. And that's a huge distinction that we need to make. Um, if you criticize Jainism, no Jain is going to go out and try to kill you. Yeah. So here are a list of organizations seeking to protect freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, freedom from religion, separation of church and state in the U.S., and to advance humanism, secularism, and science. Amnesty International, Freedom from Religion Foundation, Secular Student Alliance. You can find all of these, the ACLU, the Secular Coalition for America, the American Humanist Association, um, the International Humanist and Ethical Union, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, Atheist Alliance International, and uh, us, <laughs> Atheists of Santa Cruz and Monterey Counties, the Secular uh, Humanists of Santa Cruz County, the Secular Student Alliance at Cabrillo College, and UCSE. We're here. Thank you for joining us today and goodbye. Say I remember when you used to sit in the family car but back seat. Over, over is so safe and well So you can make lots and lots of babies No woman, no drive No woman, no drive Drive.